I will focus on the results that we found with respect to rationales, benefits, obstacles and risks of internationalization, uh, some of the uh, results about geographic priorities, top or priority activities that institutions undertake. And most of the time, I will focus on the results we've received um, from the Americas uh, and compare these to the aggregate or global level results. And since this presentation um, is also going to address the notion of indicators, um, I'm going to try and spend a little bit of time looking at going international, what this means, but most of all, how do we know when we get there? So how do we measure? What do we measure? And what can we consider to be some of the indicators? And of course, I'll conclude with um, some uh, conclusions and, and challenges, most particularly in the areas of um, the results we received, but also the challenges linked to measuring internationalization. Um, there is one person who cannot see any of the slides. Um, I hope that is only one person. I'm on slide three and uh, briefly I will... Oh, there are more than one... There's more, more than one person who cannot see the slides. Um, and since they're critical to the presentation, perhaps Francis um, can assist you in finding them. So first of all, um, IAU, um, a few words about this organization. We are a global forum of higher education leaders. Um, we bring universities and university organizations together for purposes of advocacy, research, networking, of course, and information sharing, but also IAU provides a number of services to its members. We have worked on internationalization um, in its various forms um, since the creation of this organization. I think um, it was, in fact, the the reason why IAU was created. It was created after the Second World War to assist institutions um, to build bridges of understanding and, uh, in a sense, to, to um, address uh, the, the horrors of the Second World War. But in the last two decades or so, working on internationalization has accelerated at the International Association of Universities. Um, and our, our focus has been really to promote some of the principles of good practice in internationalization, to celebrate the fact that uh, there is not a one model fits all. So celebrating diversity among our members and among their interests in internationalization, and to acknowledge that this is a complex area of, of work, just as higher education development more generally has become extremely complex. Some of the work that we have undertaken um, is noted here. For example, in 1998, IAU developed a statement of principles um, focusing on promoting cooperation and partnership. It was uh, tabled at the World Conference on Higher Education held here in Paris by UNESCO, and it sets out some of the um, important um, key principles that this association promotes. Um, in 2004, together with other organizations, we focused on a statement that promoted some ethical issues of ethical conduct in cross-border education. You may recall that in around the early uh, 2000 um, years, there was a lot of discussion about GATS and uh, export and import of education. And IAU, together with three other organizations in the United States and Canada, decided that uh, we needed to outline some 
of the considerations that universities and governments needed to take into um, in, keep in mind when developing partnerships across borders. Um, both of these statements are on our website in English, in French, unfortunately not in Spanish, although the 2004 statement um, has been adopted by many Latin American associations. The list is already uh, is also on our website. And finally, IAU has been working uh, to gather data and to monitor trends and developments by conducting global surveys. And as you can see, we have conducted three of them, the last one being the one that I will focus on. More recently, and in a way, in response to our members' requests following the third global survey, we also launched a service to help uh, provide advice to our member institutions and others in terms of their internationalization strategies development. So the ISAS uh, service is now available to anyone interested and we have conducted one of these uh, projects in Japan, and two are underway now, one in Kenya and one in Lithuania. And they're really um, a service to assist institutions to self-assess what they're doing and to make some suggestions about way forward. Um, as you all know, because you're practitioners of internationalization and scholars of internationalization, the way to define this process um, is, is uh, quite varied. There are various definitions because there are numerous approaches and practices in how institutions go international. IAU adopted um, Jane Knight's uh, definition, which is, builds on the one she elaborated with Hans de Witt, and it's simply the following. Internationalization is a multifaceted process of introducing international and intercultural dimensions into teaching, learning, research, and the mode of delivery of higher education. So a very comprehensive, um, all-encompassing way to describe the process. And yet, I think we would all agree that implementation doesn't always easily uh, fit into this kind of definition. So implementation um, is as varied um, as uh, the definitions out there and it often strays from the theory and so I think we need to really focus on what it is we're doing, what our goals are and when we come to measuring or finding indicators we need to very make certain that they fit with the goals that we're pursuing. So let me turn to the results of the survey itself. And again, I apologize to those of you who have heard this presentation before. Um, the third global survey uh, is, was sent out to about 5,000 institutions around the world, but the results are compiled on the basis of 745 replies which we received from 115 countries. As you can see, um, we had a fairly um, comprehensive sample and if one looks at the number of universities worldwide, this pie chart resembles quite closely the overall numbers. So it was a small sample uh, there is no way to deny that, but it was a fairly representative sample. And in any case, it's the most global sample that has ever been brought together. Um, we asked a lot of questions, and I have decided to focus this presentation on the responses to just a few of them. So the first one, um, the question asked, why internationalization was important, why institutions engaged in internationalization. And in this chart, um, you, I'm looking at the notes and I see that uh, Gabriella 
Shumpitas cannot see the video, so I'm I'm sorry about that, but um, perhaps Francis can help. Um, so the slides here and most of the following slides are organized in a similar manner. Um, they compare the aggregate, the world, Latin America and the Caribbean region, and North America. And you can see at the top that at the aggregate, the most important, by far, rationale for internationalization is to improve student preparedness. If you look at the Latin American and Caribbean reply, the same uh, is true here, but to an even greater extent. Same with North America. It by, out, by far outshines all the other rationales. Uh, at the global level, at the world level, the second most important rationale is to internationalize curriculum, followed by enhancing international profile, and then by the need to strengthen research and knowledge production. If you look at Latin America and the Caribbean, you can see that the second priority is the same, but the notion of enhancing international profile is relatively modest, while the focus on strengthening research and knowledge production is much, much higher. So you can see in this chart how, at the global level, the rationales um, are lined up, and how Latin America and the Caribbean, on the one hand, and North America deviates from those aggregates. Um, when we asked the expected benefits that internationalization was to bring to institutions, it is not surprising that they should match quite closely to the rationales. I mean, institutions uh, pursue a policy with some expected benefits. So um, the notion that uh, increased international awareness of by on the part of the students would be uh, achieved is to be expected. And as you can see, at the aggregate level, it is um, the top benefit, as well as for Latin America and uh, North America. So there is a good coherence between the rationales and um, expected benefits. And if you go down the slide, similarly for strengthening research and uh, knowledge production, um, where it is more importantly a benefit for Latin America than at the aggregate level, which was the case in, uh, in the rationales. Um, I think what is uh, also important to note here is that the prestige enhanced presti prestige and profile have decreased in importance, whereas curriculum uh, considerations have, have uh, been identified as a more important expected benefit, particularly in the North American institutions. We asked universities what stopped them from being more internationally, or what were the most important internal obstacles to internationalization? Um, here you can see that globally and in each of the two regions, insufficient financial resources were by far the most important obstacle. Where things become interesting um, is below that first obstacle. I think that financial resources uh, uh, were in a way expected to come out at the top. But when we look below that, look at the deviations from the aggregate. For example, um, it is, I think, striking that for Latin America and the Caribbean, um, the limited staff expertise and the lack of language capacity um, is a fairly important internal obstacle. And if you look at the very bottom, you can see that international engagement not being recognized um, for faculty promotion, etc., is 
a significant internal obstacle in North America. And uh, I think that these, uh, these results can guide, in a way, policy development if um, overcoming these obstacles, other than financial, are within the realm of the institutional policy development. Again, I also note, for example, that, um, and this was the case in, in other regions as well, the inflexibility of curriculum was cited quite uh, frequently in, for example, Asia and Latin America. So looking at these internal obstacles, particularly the ones that can be overcome, I think is, a, is an interesting um, possibility when developing policy. Because funding was such an important, um, expected and was such an important obstacle, um, IAU also asked uh, institutions where actually their funding came from to finance internationalization. Here, I think it is quite interesting to note that at the aggregate and across the regions, almost all of the institutions say that general institutional budget um, is the most important source of their funding. Where, again, I would um, highlight, and I think there is an arrow I can use to do this, yes, um, maybe not. Um, it was working when I tried last time, but look at um, the not funded percentage in Latin America and the Caribbean. It is by far uh, the uh, second most important answer that institutions gave, a quarter of the institutions in Latin America indicated that internationalization simply wasn't funded. You can also look at the external, the strength of the external public funding and see how well European institutions are um, faring in this, in this area. And when we talk about um, recruitment of students for uh, revenue generation, you can see that for uh, North American universities, um, and these were composed of US and Canadian institutions, not including Mexico, you can see that 17% of the institutions rely on um, the funds they generate, not just from international students, but also from all international activities. So self-funding is an important aspect of internationalization. We noticed that in, in most of the time when one speaks about internationalization, academic mobility and student mobility um, is one of the most important priority activities. And so we also wanted to test the institutions or, or ask the institutions to actually tell us how mobile um, were their students. And so here you can see we ask the institutions to identify what percentage of the uh, total undergraduate enrollment was represented by international students. So on your left hand side, this side, the first part, you can see the HEIs according to the number of undergraduate international students as part of, as, as a percentage of the total enrollment. And you can see that by far the majority, 66%, um, have less than 5% of their student body come from abroad. In fact, 33%, uh, a full third, have less than 1% of their student body coming from uh, abroad. The other pie chart, the second pie chart, looks at, and these are undergraduate students. We ask a similar question for the graduate, and uh, those results are in the report. But here, I looked only for numbers for the undergraduates. The second pie chart shows that the opportunities that institutions offer to their students to go abroad. And here you can see the numbers are even 
less glorious because a full 48%, almost half of the respondents, send less than 1% of their students uh, for a period of study abroad. If you add the under 5%, you can see that we're looking at 76% of the institution. So a very low level of mobility, despite the fact that we place student preparedness at the very top of our rationales, at the top of the expected benefits, and that mobility, student exchanges, etc., are the most important activities when one asks in terms of internationalization. So we thought perhaps there were new and interesting developments that um, we could track as well. And one of these new developments is for institutions to offer dual and joint degrees. This slide reports on the findings about dual and double degrees. Um, these are degrees in which a student or a graduate has ends up with two distinct credentials. Um, and as you can see, m worldwide, almost half the institutions indicate that they do offer such dual or double degree programs. Um, this is actually a, a fairly big increase from the previous uh, global survey that IAU undertook, and I think demonstrates a, uh, um, an activity that will see more growth as we go. You can see that by far it is European universities that are engaged in this work, um, but North American institutions are not that far behind. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean are among the lowest participants or among the lower participants in, in this area. Um, just to compare, we wanted to know in a way whether the joint degree was a more popular um, approach. The joint degrees um, enable students to graduate with one certificate, but which carries the names of the uh, two or more offering institutions. And here, the numbers are slightly lower, only 41% of the uh, institutions worldwide indicate that this is um, something they offer. Um, and you can see that in Europe, it is a less popular approach. Again, Latin America tends to um, be among the lowest. In this case, it is the lowest uh, of institutions in terms of engaging with joint degrees. Um, whereas in North America, they are uh, fairly popular with almost half the institutions uh, agreeing that they offer joint degree programs. As in the past, IAU asked institutions to identify risks as they perceive them in, in the process of internationalization. And again, uh, you can see that um, there are some variations to, to the results. Um, I think what is clear is where the deviations take place. Let's look at uh, commodification. Most of the institutions responding line up at the world level, at Latin America, in Latin America and North America, with a slight uh, higher preoccupation with commodification slash commercialization uh, coming in at the, from the United States and Canada. But if you look at the brain drain, you can see that for Latin America, this is by far the most important risk that uh, institutions have identified, followed not too closely, but followed by uh, the, the worry about an increased number of foreign degree mills. What is also interesting here is the North American replies. If you look at uh, where they are standing out, 
um, you can see that first of all they stand out in the no reply area many North American institutions did not answer this question and quite a few answered that there were no risks and if there were risks the risk came from an over emphasis on the recruitment of foreign um, uh, students for, uh, for foreign fees. Now let me just stop for one second because I see a question um, from Jeanette. I think all of you can probably see it and she wonders in the double degree um, area whether they were between the same regions or between different regions. Um, it's a very good question Janet. I can't answer um, because we did not ask the institutions but when I look at the geographic priorities you may be able to get um, a better sense but we did not ask whether the institutions created double and dual or joint degrees with institutions within the same region. Um, something we might ask in our next uh, survey. So when you look at these risks, you can see that um, for Latin America and the Caribbean, they are real. They're fairly strongly articulated. If I were to look at the global, um, at the global level or at the other region, sorry, uh, you would see that these concerns on the part of Latin America and the Caribbean are matched with those expressed in Latin in um, Africa and to some extent in Asia and the Pacific where um, the Middle East or Arab region stands out in terms of risks is that they scored very high on the fear of losing cultural identity. It was one of their top risks and you can see that here um, it doesn't really even show up. Now I come to the geographic um, uh, priority as identified by institutions and you can see and I'll help you read um, this table the best way to read it is across rather than down uh, although both tell us something but if you look at the yellows which indicate the top priority chosen by each region, uh, you can see that at least three regions have chosen their own region as the top priority. So Africa has chosen Africa right here. Um, the Asia Pacific has chosen Asia Pacific uh, as its geographic priority and Europe has chosen Europe as its priority. Now, this could be um, in part uh, an answer to Jeanette because yes, the Bologna process has been extremely important in Europe and promotes both European collaboration within Europe but also European attractiveness to others. Um, so yes, this could mean that dual and double degrees and joint degrees are more likely to be elaborated among institutions from the same region. But it's not necessarily the case. As you know, um, also Europe has been uh, reaching out to, to other regions and, and, and encouraging uh, collaboration with Latin America, with Africa, etc. So it is possible that uh, double and dual degrees are in fact with regions outside or with countries outside one's region. What I think is important here is that overall Europe is identified as the top region for Europe, Latin America and the Middle East. Um, that it is clear that intra-regional collaboration is very important. But what is also important is if you look across this way you will see that, for example, Latin America and the Caribbean were not identified by any other region but their own, Latin America and the Caribbean, as a priority. 
And even there, it's not the top priority, it's number two. The same exactly scenario is for the Middle East, which also identifies Europe as its top priority and its own region as the second priority. Um, Africa across here is its own top priority, but no one else's. And finally, North America comes in either as second or third for a number of regions. It is no longer the top uh, region for any uh, anyone. And, uh, sorry, sorry, for, for um, Asia and the Pacific, they have scored it uh, as their top region. But what is also interesting is that for North America, the no geographic priority uh, came out a second. So uh, one can say either uh, American and North American institutions are highly opportunistic um, or they basically go according to an academic interest, political, um, uh, economic, etc. But they are not choosing any one particular region. So what can we say, having just looked at these few um, conclusions or, or results, what can we say in conclusion? I would say, and I think uh, uh, it's quite clear, that these results show the extent to which there is a focus on student and preparing students for an internationalized or a globalized world. And um, we could not show you in these results, but in our report, the notion that mobility was highly important uh, was clear. And yet, despite all the efforts that are being made, uh, actual mobility remains very low. And I could also tell you that it is a very unbalanced mobility, both globally. What I mean is there are few countries that act as hosts to the vast majority of the students, and there are only a few countries that represent the majority of the senders, but it's also imbalanced, if you will, if you look at the incoming and outgoing students. For example, the U U.S. is a host to um, very, very large numbers of students and yet sends uh, among the lowest numbers. The U.K. and Australia are in the same um, position, whereas there are countries such as China today that are quickly moving towards a balanced mobility. China is currently sending out um, just a few thousand students more than it is actually hosting. Canada is also a country that is getting closer and closer to a more balanced mobility. Uh, but on the whole, it is not a balanced uh, uh, picture. We see that international research collaboration as a rationale for internationalization is less important at the aggregate level, but it is the top priority for most of the developing regions of the world. Again, I did not show you slides about this, but we certainly know that internationalization is increasingly important as a policy inside the universities. Um, our report shows that uh, people who are responsible for internationalization have uh, risen in seniority in terms of the positions they occupy, and most universities have seen the importance of this policy increase over the past three or four years. But we see that funding is today the most important internal and external obstacle. Um, Internally, faculty interest, faculty readiness, and the capacity of staff to be engaged internationally are seen as fairly important obstacles. And this is particularly the case in Latin America and, um, and the Caribbean. We saw that there is a strong link between uh, prestige and internationalization. And I think this will potentially have an impact on um, future partnerships on the ways international um, networks are created and built. Um, 
we saw that risks are visible more to some regions and again more to the developing regions than they are to uh, others. In, ca in, in uh, the case of North America, you saw that uh, many institutions did not reply or did not see the risk. The same uh, was exactly the same in the European replies. And finally, the geographic priorities are stable. These were the same priorities that we found in the previous survey, and they are highly focused on a few regions. If we look at the Americas as a region, um, we can see that there are quite strong differences between North American higher education institutions and the Latin American and Caribbean replies that we uh, saw. Miriam um, Rabkin is asking whether um, the PowerPoint presentation can be shared. Um, and yes, the agreement was that it would be made available to you um, as well as the full report. So yes, you will have um, these slides. So again, if we look at the distinguishing between North American higher education institutions, um, there was a much stronger focus on students and curriculum, whereas in Latin American and uh, Caribbean institutions, the focus on research was uh, stronger than um, in North America. We also see significant differences in terms of obstacles and perceived risks, as I already mentioned. In North America, um, the, the institutions noted as a major obstacle the fact that internationalization was not a top priority at the national policy level. Um, they also pointed to visas and the non-recognition for faculty as major obstacles, but demonstrated relatively little or no concern with risk. In Latin America and the Caribbean institutions, funding the lack of expertise among staff and language capacity were uh, really important uh, issues, as was the recognition of credentials, uh, which I didn't mention, but which came up. Brain drain and commercialization were noted by Latin American uh, institutions as, as major risks. Finally, as I said, dual and double degrees are uh, the preferred option in both parts of the Americas re region, both in North America and Latin America and Caribbean, but they don't seem to be a top priority area for development in Latin America uh, yet. And finally, the geographic priorities identified, I think this is something to, uh, to note and be aware of um, as internationalization develops around the world. It seems that Europe and Asia Pacific appear a much more attractive uh, set of institutions than, than Latin America and the Caribbean. So now let me turn to um, the, the, the going international and, and how do we know when we have become international. So let me turn to the indicators and to measurements. Uh, the first thing I would say is that for the most part, internationalization is not an end in itself. It is a means. Um, usually, it is a means to improving quality, to providing a better academic environment, to uh, improve the capacity to research, to undertake work that is not possible um, otherwise, etc. But it is not an end in itself. However, when you want to establish measurements and, and, and indicators, you can set, a, set as a goal to become a more internationalized institution. So in that respect, internationalization can serve as a goal. We use indicators to basically find out whether we reach our goals. They are very useful to monitor 
once we have set those goals, whether we're making progress or not towards them. But the starting point uh, before starting to measure, before starting to monitor and looking at indicators, the first aspect is to set goals and to set policy and design strategy and actions before you begin to measure. But at the same time, as, the, as you do, I think, develop these goals, considering how they may be measured is part and parcel of the process, considering how you will know whether you have reached those goals or whether you're making progress towards them. That can be part and parcel of the development of actions and strategies. Too often, we at IAU are quite guilty of this. Um, we do this afterwards, and it's much more difficult to do. So it is a, a, an undertaking that sort of accompanies the entire um, goal setting and policy development process. I think we need to be very conscious, as I've said, internationalization takes on a number of forms and, and approaches. So we have, and it may have, multiple goals. So just as it has multiple goals, it can and has to have multiple indicators. I will stress the fact that we need to look for both qualitative and quantitative indicators and that they need to fit. Um, we need to find indicators that, that actually measure what it is that we're looking for and fit with our strategy. So if, for example, um, a commitment to internationalization as a means to improve quality is something we believe in, and so internationalization is a process that improves the institutional quality overall, some of the indicators very simply um, are, for example, having an institution-wide policy. The presence of a policy is an indicator that there is commitment to this. A mission statement that spells out why and how internationalization is important, and in the best of cases, the full integration of internationalization into the institutional overall plan. Um, there are many universities today that do no, no longer develop an internationalization policy, if you will, but they infuse their overall strategic plan with the international dimension. It becomes an integral part of the policy planning uh, process. You can have regularly regular discussions to update the objectives, to identify expected outcomes. Um, you can agree on a few measures. The process of doing this, in my view, is an indicator that you can track. If you've not updated your objectives for the past five years, well, there's something to be said about your commitment to internationalization. We at IAU felt when we designed the questionnaire about internationalization that looking more at who is responsible for internationalization is an indicator of that commitment. Are they senior enough? Are they um, expert enough? Does the expertise that they bring to the job include international um, experience, language skills? Is that part of the process of selecting the people who um, are in charge of internationalization? Um, of course, adequate and sustained investment by the institution into internationalization is another indicator. And I, I would underline here the notion of sustained. Um, too often internationalization, as we saw in the North American case, is expected to pay for itself, if not to generate revenue. Um, in my esteem, 
um, relying too much on project funding or on revenue generation directly shows in a sense a lack of commitment and a lack of sustainability of such a policy in the long run. So an adequate and sustained investment of resources both human and financial in this area is an indicator of an institutional um, commitment to internationalization. And of course um, the, the monitoring framework, specific timelines, milestones, incentives built in, rewards built in, some recognition of successes um, is also an important aspect of um, a framework or a, a set of measures that can tell you whether your institution is really truly um, on its way to becoming international. It is often far too easy to measure what you can count and not measure what counts. I'm not sure who said that, but I think it's a very, very important um, uh, distinction to be made. The list that is on your screen is all the things you can measure. The number of international students that you have in your, on your campus or in your university, the number of students you sent abroad, the number of visiting foreign academics, the number of institutional agreements your president or rector has signed in the last year or so, the number of visitors, international visitors that you have hosted as a university, the size and budget of the international office, size in terms of staff, the number of courses simply with the word international in the title and the number of course of co-authored articles with foreign colleagues. I'm not saying these things are not important. They can be counted and they are a sign of a certain international level of internationalization, but they're not the only thing. You, we all know that um, the number of international students on campus can have fairly little impact on how international is a classroom environment. Um, when there are many students from one particular country, we all know they can uh, constitute their own small ghetto, have fairly little interaction with local students and um, go home with poor language skills, which sometimes is astonishing. Uh, number of students studying abroad, if the students are going for very short term or if they're not prepared well, they can come back with fairly limited impact on their learning and on their um, thinking about uh, uh, their international experience. I could go through this list. The number of institutional agreements that are purely at the paper, they have uh, the paper uh, value but have no real impact on the institution. We all know this. So be careful when identifying uh, indicators not to fall into the trap of measuring what can be counted rather than measuring what counts. What counts if we look at the rationale for internationalization are learning, what learning outcomes the students are, are walking away with, changing attitudes, improved understanding. Those are just a few of the things that we are trying to, to uh, achieve and yet they are difficult to measure. Um, preparing students for an international environment was the number one rationale. So one of the or some of the indicators that we can look at is the existence at the institutional level or at the faculty level at the department level of learning outcomes related to international dimensions. How many institutions, departments, faculty, faculties or, or uh, schools have actually established such learning outcomes? Not too many yet. Um, 
available mobility opportunities, obviously, but also looking at how international students are integrated, how they're used um, in the classroom. Are they turned to as resources? Are they um, expected to share with their fellow local students some of their perspectives? Um, can our local students engage in communities with <coughs> city or with, with groups from other parts of the world that are in our cities, in our uh, uh, regions? <coughs> Excuse me. When we look at internationalizing the curriculum, again, a top priority for, um, for us, it isn't enough to look at those courses or programs that have the word international in the title. We actually do need to look at the courses content of the courses and the focus that they come. Are they comparative? Are they <clears throat> looking um, at, at uh, uh, issues from a cross uh, cultural perspective? Um, yes, we can look at joint and dual degree programs and count those but also look at what the content of those programs are, um, what the content of those programs is. In any course, you can use international case studies, you can add um, to reading lists um, books and articles by foreign authors. How many institutions insist on um, strong language capacities among the students? Not just one second language, but a second or third uh, foreign language is increasingly the norm in, in some of the European institutions. And again, coming back to using foreign students as a resource in the classroom, measuring or, or making sure that we track these items is just as important as counting the number of students. Um, Another difficult uh, uh, aspect is to measure, to find ways to measure improvements in quality. If we agree that internationalization is a way to improve quality, we need to make sure that that is what we're looking at. We also need to measure or assess or be aware uh, of the value we place on partnerships. How well do we work with our partners? That too is part and parcel of uh, an assessment of how well we're doing internationally. And I would suggest that we need to look at our partners in terms of our global outreach. Are we working only with a very small, narrow area, geographic area, or are we truly reaching out in a, in a global way to uh, partners in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, wherever we are not. I think just as uh, with uh, the discussion on quality assurance, fitness for purpose debate, I think there is also um, a, the notion that yes, we need a good fit with the goals we pursue, but we also need to consider the goals themselves. We need to assess whether there are the right goals. Um, I think that that uh, sometimes um, our assessments tend to be matching what our goals are with indicators of, of progress, but we forget to look whether we're actually pursuing the right goals. So um, I think this is very important and, and some of the um, things that we should be looking at are, for example, uh, is quality the same as international visibility and prestige? Because it may mean that we skew our international networking in a particular way, um, and that may not necessarily be of the most uh, academic or, or uh, uh, social value. So partnership with only well-ranked institutions may not be suitable for every institution, nor for every goal that we're pursuing. Um, do we accept invitations to participate in international scientific projects uh, because they are international, or do we select them because they're relevant for our local purposes? Um, 
do we only seek excellent international students applying for access or is part of our strategy to provide access to as many and as wide a grouping of students as possible. Um, so indicators and measurements need to go along with those purposes and objectives that we've set out. Um, increasing research capacity and knowledge production, a rationale that was selected by many institutions. Yes, we can look at the number of research projects, but we also have to look at the relevance of the content. The number of publications is important, but also who has access to them and where they're accessible. Um, the outputs need to address urgent and emerging prog problems globally, but at home as well. So, and again, networking with scientists should be as um, comprehensive, if you will, of all the regions of the world as possible. So what are the challenges? Just a few. I've been talking for a long time. Um, first of all, deciding how to assess, monitor progress, to measure or not to measure. Um, and if you're going to measure, to begin measuring as you set out your goals. I would also suggest that as wide a consultation of those stakeholders in the university um, as possible is really needed to get a buy-in, not only on the goals, but later on the indicators that you will be using to assess progress. Identify indicators that fit, but make sure that some of these indicators are also qualitative, not just quantitative. I think it's important to be flexible and to analyze the results regularly, adjusting both the goals and the indicators accordingly. Sometimes they can seem like they fit, but you're actually, uh, you will actually realize that your, your outcomes are quite different from what you had set out to achieve. They may be just as worthwhile, but you need to adjust both indicators and goals accordingly. And I really believe that it's important to involve stakeholders um, and celebrate the successes and have some incentives and rewards uh, for achieving those successes. Let me just end with IAU's internationalization agenda. First, we continue to disseminate the global survey report, and you can all order it at um, a fairly major discount as uh, participants in this webinar. I think um, Francis and others will sh help you. Otherwise, you can also write to me. As I said, we continue to offer the Internationalization Strategies Advisory Service. And we will be holding internationalization workshops upcoming in Nairobi, Kenya, just before our conference in November. Um, there, I have received an invitation to organize a workshop in Iran um, also this fall. And we are planning to hold a workshop in Rio de Janeiro as part of the CAIE Next meeting. My website is uh, identified there. Please, if you're interested in the statements, you can, um, you can download them and read them there. And of course, please, you can always uh, email me if you have questions. And uh, now I'm going to, I see that Francis has invited all of you to um, send in your questions. And I hope I will be able to, uh, to answer them as uh, well as possible. Thank you. It is a very strange um, experience not to see you. So I'm not sure how many of you are still there. Um, but uh, I hope you found this interesting. Um, the cost of the full survey report um, is, I believe, 20 uh, euros plus mailing and uh, at that discounted price.
you're welcome, Damien. <laughs> you're welcome, Francis. <laughs> Can I activate my camera? My camera should be on. You should be able to see me. Hello, Thomas. Um, I'm sorry you can't see me. It should be the video camera should be on. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Yes. Dear Eva, if I may, I would like to say uh, only a few conclusion words. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, your presentation, which was quite interesting. Uh, I guess that everybody could benefit from um, the, uh, the, 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 the elements from the AU report, which is available on the AU website as well. So I, I'll give the address in the chat section of your website. And uh, thank you very much to all participants in assisting and participating in the, uh, this first webinar of the Conference of the Americas on International Education. Um, I hope that everything was useful. Um, we would like to remind you that we will put the presentation available to you. And as well that uh, this webinar was the first of a series of uh, web conferences that will go throughout the year on uh, current trends in internationalization in the Americas and throughout the world. So for further information, we invite you to consult the CAI website, which will put the, uh, the, the direction in the, um, in the chat section. And as well, for the next uh, CAI meeting, which will be in Rio de Janeiro uh, from April 25 to 28, 2012. It is very um, uncomfortable well, very much, for you to see and me, but I cannot see any of you, you so <laughs> um, it is a process to get used to, I think. Uh, Janet asks whether I have any information about the reasons for selecting a region. No, um, I would suspect that uh, there are multiple reasons uh, for selecting a particular region. One of them may be simply and as opportunistically as, as that, the fact that there are programs available um, such as Erasmus Mundus or the specific regional programs that uh, the European uh, uh, Commission has put in place to, to stimulate collaboration with Latin America or with, with Africa or with Asia Pacific or frankly with, within North America as well. So I think there could be that. Um, there could be simply, um, as often I think is the case, a, a number of faculty members who have an interest or a history in a particular region and uh, are familiar with colleagues and begin collaboration. Um, of course, there is the notion of prestige and uh, trying to work with the best. So there are many, many reasons, I think, that go into making a decision uh, for a regional priority. Um, there's a question, are there any indicators in this survey regarding faculty mobility for postgraduate studies abroad and joint research publications? No, we did not ask um, such factual questions. What we did ask, and we do have some information about uh, the number of graduate students who are mobile, but we did not ask about specific numbers of faculty uh, mobility. We did, I think, uh, I'm 
pretty certain there is a question that that lists academic mobility and staff exchanges as one of the activities and institutions could select whether it was an important one or not but we did not ask for specific numbers and we certainly did not ask about the numbers of um, research projects uh, or publications with colleagues from abroad. It wasn't that kind of a survey. Um, someone, Gabriel says that he cannot uh, hear because I put the video on. So I'm going to stop my webcam and I'm going to, uh, and hopefully you will hear me better uh, and not see me. I'm, I see that uh, multiple attendees are typing, so I'm just waiting to... Uh... Yes, I will be um, at the EAIE in Copenhagen. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh... Um, let me just read this question. Sorry, I have to go up a little. Um, I mean, Jared Buto from the U.S., I'm interested in the notion of, oh, just a second. I, um, I'm interested in the notion of international student recruitment as a revenue, um, as a, I can't read the question because um, other, okay, as a re revenue generator in North America. Any thoughts about the sustainability of this as a long-term strategy, given the cost of providing the, uh, providing, sorry. Well, Jared, I think that, um, we were a little surprised by the fact that um, North American institutions stated that um, put, placed such a focus on recruitment of international students as uh, revenue generators. They did it in two different parts of the questionnaire, which means that it really is um, a, a clear response. They first said that it was one of the risks was that there would be too much emphasis on that. And the second way uh, they've done that is that they indicated that that was a major source of revenue in terms of funding for internationalization. A third way in which North Americans also highlighted student recruitment uh, was to say that it was pushed by demographic regions, uh, reasons, demogra reasons of demog demographics. So first, I think it is something that will remain for quite some time in the future. I also believe that um, instead of um, U.S. having a difficult time, other countries, such as the U.K., for example, are going to begin coming up in terms of price to almost the same costs. So the U.S. will not be pricing itself out of the market. Second, um, my sense is that United States has not yet begun, really, a marketing process. Um, so far, I think United States has just relied on uh, being an attractive, uh, one of the most attractive higher education systems in the world, and having students flock to um, to them, I think that if United States were to launch major recruitment campaigns, uh, there is still a lot of I would say elasticity in the market, and I think they could still do well. Um, 
I don't know. I'm not a very good crystal ball gazer, so I don't know how long this is sustainable for, but I do believe that we're looking at quite a few years still where um, recruiting of foreign students for fee revenues um, is going to stay with us. I don't know if I answered you, but I couldn't see the rest of the question. And now I can't read. I'll just try and read this one. For the indicators you discussed, have they been developed to apply to all regions and institutions therein, or are um, they region specific? I suspect the survey was uniform for all, but do you think it is uh, worthwhile to develop criteria and indicators for assessing institutional characteristics and internationalization efforts in higher education institutions in regions that have different higher education systems? Well, first of all, yes, the questionnaire has to be the same in order to be comparable across the regions. And for IAU, it was very, and it continues to be very important to um, be able to monitor trends and to monitor how different react uh, regions respond to those trends. At the same time, I am very much of the mind that indicators should be not just regionally specific, but institutionally specific. But that's quite different. Um, as I said, each region and I mean each institution should set its own goals and therefore measure its its uh, success or failure uh, according to those goals. Um, I think the the what is what is clear is that the strategies for internationalization are to be regionally differentiated. That's clear because we don't all need, we don't all have, we don't all exist in the same context, we don't have the same resources, we don't have the same historical linkages to other parts of the world, different language capacities, etc., etc. So institutional strategies will be highly differentiated and regions are, as regions are, highly differentiated. But at the same time, I, I, I'm just writing about this, internationalization cannot be done alone. You have to work with others. So in a way, your internationalization strategy must fit and be complemented by your partner's strategies. One of the key issues that comes out of this survey is that we cannot be, uh, we, we should not be developing our strategies without a good sensitivity and understanding of what our partners need and want. And at times, I think that even in the best of wills, or even with the best of wills, um, partnerships and collaborations are not designed to benefit both parties they serve one party more than another, quite possibly, but they're also influenced by the mechanisms that are made available. Um, in that respect, I think what the European Commission is able to do is really influence how mobility takes place because they put in place instruments for mobility such as no other region can put in place or has put in place. So you have mechanisms that can structure collaboration. It is, I believe, up to the institutions to be very um, careful not to impose on their partners me mechanisms or approaches that may not be fitting for them. And so for that reason, I think um, undertaking surveys like ours that show these differences is really important. I'm not sure I was clear, but I think you ask a very important question and I think it does come, um, it stems from the results. So if we didn't find these results, your questions 
would not resonate so much. Um, sorry, I have to look at this. I agree. How then do we reconcile this with the ever-growing pressure of international rankings? Not to open up a new discussion, but just to bring up the point of constant pressure that is facing institutions that are internationalizing. I think you understood my points very well, because if you look at one of those um, one of these um, slides, I actually do question the fact that if we allow um, these trends to continue, institutions will only partner with institutions that are alike, that are like them, that are as well ranked as they are. And so the whole purpose of, not the whole purpose of internationalization, but um, part of the purpose of the internationalization process, as I understand it and as I feel it, it should be, um, will be lost because we will not um, create partnerships with institutions that, for example, most need our collaboration or would most gain from such a collaboration. And we will not learn from those institutions that are existing and evol developing in a completely different context. So I think you are right and you are, uh, it is going to be, I think, a struggle. But um, I think we need to, um, in my view, reposition internationalization, not as a utilitarian concept, but as a concept that is truly uh, in the interest of academic endeavors and discovery, if you will. Well, it's almost quarter to 7 p.m. in Paris, and before the well, building shuts down the here, <laughs> um, Catherine. Yes, yes, Catherine, the slides will be available. <laughs> So thank you very much. Yes, I, I am going to be at EAIE for a couple of days. I speak in a global dialogue session, so you will be able to find me. Thank you very much for uh, staying, though we had some technical problems at the beginning. And I hope to meet some of you face to face. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. And my excuse, my my uh, my uh, I seek your forgiveness for speaking in English and not in Spanish. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, okay. If anything, if they have, uh, if people have more questions, uh, for sure they can uh, write you at the email that you said in the uh, indicated Thank in you, the Francis. presentation. Thank you very much for all participants, and uh, we we'll hope to see you in the next webinar and other um, meetings about academic cooperation. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>